Thank you. Good morning. Uh, you forgot this. So this presentation embraces two of the main themes of this year DevOps days, which are feedback loops and what new things are you doing. By showing a history of what inspired Solnet to embrace DevOps, we would like to explain how DevOps in turn made Solnet embrace a cultural shift on its processes and even its strategy, particularly in terms of using experimentation and prototyping. How powerful feedback loops can be when you are experimenting with the company's culture. Culture is a key element of any company and the bigger the company is, the more important it is to get it right and probably the harder it is to change it. So we will discuss a little bit about company culture. Then we'll talk about how DevOps can help us change that. We will go over a case study. We will see its conclusions. And you see here a lot of references to the DevOps handbook. You saw it in previous presentations. You see a lot of references here, OK? A little bit about myself. I am Gleitson Nascimento. I am originally from Brazil but I live in Wellington for the past six years. You can see the coolest little capital to my right. Is that right? Yeah, right. To my right. Uh, I'm very passionate about open source and about software. And this is my first uh, time speaking in public in an audience, in a conference. And it's an honor to do it here on beautiful Singapore. But you know, enough about me. We will start by bringing here a quote from Martin Fowler. Martin Fowler says, even with the best tools, DevOps is just another buzzword if you don't have the right culture. But what is the right culture? What is it? So to think about this, I will present a picture to you that some of you may recognize, some of you may not. So show of hands the audience for who recognizes this picture. Yep. I'm part of the audience. This is a picture of Blockbuster. 20, 20 something years ago, we used to go there to you know, get movies and watch movies. Uh, and I believe everyone in the audience likes movies, right? Yeah, show of hands, yeah? Cool, amazing. What I like about movies is the opportunity to put yourself in someone's place. Uh, the way that the movie presents themselves uh, it's so easy to feel this empathy and uh, uh, see the characters in the screen and dream for a second. Could I do what they are doing right now in the screen? Like, for example, could I be a superhero and save the world? Or could I read whatever is written in those screens if I were there, right? Or could I be Robert De Niro's workmate? Everyone here knows where he works in this movie, right? Show of hands. Yep. So this is Robert De Niro as an intern for the movie About the Fit. Sorry, the company was About the Fit, but the movie is the intern. And About the Fit is a fashion company. There is a cool atmosphere there. But in my case here, this is a large company with the right culture. And why that? Well, they had friendly staff. They were knowledgeable on their fields, but they had skill in other areas, or what we call a cross-functional team. And I'm not talking about the Nero, but he also counts. Uh, he also, uh, they also showed fresh attitude when they hired a, a, a senior member to the company. Uh, they also had the user focus and business mindset. They had the CEO hands-on. So you know, it was a great fictional place to work for. Okay, just like. My next example here, New Hampshire greetings from the movie 500 Days of Summer. Another large company, but this time they were making business greeting cards. Sorry, they were making greeting cards, right? And uh, wedding cards and birthday cards. But the interesting bit here is that the movie is staged in 2006 and the company was already ha uh, having teams uh, dedicated to a specific kind of greeting card, or what we call product teams, right? They already work it in an agile manner, which is pretty cool, right? We're talking 2006. But in this example, we have Tom, 
and he has personal issues with dealing with the end of his relationship and the entire company goes out of their way to help him keep his cool, to stay fine. Right? And uh, this is another uh, example of, of, of the right culture because it's the whole office supporting one employee. Okay? My last example here is probably one of my perfect ones is Macmillan Toys from the movie Big. Does anyone here have watched or remember the movie? Yep. The movie, for those who don't know about it, is most famous because of this scene here where Tom Hanks plays on this huge piano with his boss, which is also the CEO of the company, okay? But in this example, and this example is here because this company was so focused in bringing good quality toys to children's families that they had a dedicated section of the business for testing toys. Or as we call today, a, a team focused in user experience, right? That is another great example of a large enterprise with a solid culture and a great attitude towards their business. So in their own ways, those companies resonate quite nicely with this, with this mindset I'm bringing here. And why that? Because if we go back to the code, it's all about the right culture, right? And at least in those movies, they have showed us that they have got it right. So that's awesome. How can I do that? How can I achieve the right culture? Probably you will need to change the journey of your company and move it towards a new direction. And that's exactly where DevOps comes to help. With its three ways, flow, feedback, and continual learning and experimentation. But to answer this question in more detail, I would like to bring here my first quote from the DevOps handbook. By creating this continual and dynamic system of learning and experimenting, we enable teams to rapidly and automatically adapt to a never-changing environment, which ultimately help us win the marketplace. That's cool. How do we learn collectively? How do we do that? Many ways. We can learn by checking what we did right. We can learn by analyzing what went wrong, fixing, and do it again until it is right. We can learn by asking others, we can learn by hearing from others' experiences, or we can learn by having experiences ourselves. And that's the interesting piece here. Experimenting doesn't always mean experimenting with the object of the study. Sometimes it means experimenting with the direct users of the object of study, right? And the cool bit here is, Experimentation is actually not new. It's been here for a while now. And Google, Facebook, and other big and small companies have already tested using experiments. They have also created products and features using experimentation so their customers can perform experiments with their users. Or companies have used experimentation as a strategic way to find the perfect balance across user experience of their own employees and company's purpose. Therefore, when it comes to experimenting on its own culture, an action that relies on the same methodology, of course, it's only about companies spending time and going through experimenting their own processes to find out what is the optimal fit for their culture, right? It's about showing customer empathy when thinking about how a feature should be designed so that employees can become more aligned and reasoning at the reasoning of the company, of the purpose of the company, of the feature that you have implemented. So when you are developing products, or if you are in a startup, you know, this is great because the, the purpose is there, the skills are there, the people are there. However, what happens when you are part of an IT service company? What is the difference? Is there a difference? Can you correlate? Um, if we think about it, uh, the, the IT service provider, he has as its end a product that is the service, right? We can shape it as a product, but it's still abstract in some ways. In which ways, you would ask? An IT service provider has somehow different goals. Uh, they look for customer satisfaction, or the, or the customer may not come back. 
They try to deliver value easily instead of going through complex processes. They want to provide estimates accurately. They must deliver their fa uh, the services fast. They must provide support in the simplest way possible. They want to spend time bonding with the customer and improving the experience. And finally, they hope to exceed the customer's expectations, like we all do here. And that's where Solnet enters. That's the company I work for. It exists as Solnet Solutions since 2001, provides consultancy, coaching, delivery, support services for customers around New Zealand, and has been doing some very cool DevOps work for the past five years for private and public customers. Solnet fits exactly the bill. It's an IT service company, and it has made some important realizations a few quarters ago. Uh, they realized, we realized, that a huge amount of wasted effort was spent at the start of each project in what we call environment setup, or project setup, or sprint zero work. In another investigation, we realized that most of those processes could be automated if we followed the DevOps first way, or flow. We realized also that we lacked a robust process to support the standardization of our technology or application stacks. The result being that no two solutions could be trusted to be architected the same way. And this was limiting our velocity and our desired effectiveness. However, if we were instead uh, uh, proposing, uh, uh, if we were actually reviewing what we were doing for reuse where as possible, we would speed up development and it would make products easier for us to support later. And this way, we would have achieved uh, uh, the second way by doing the first way. With feedback loops, we would be able to increase flow. Also, we were taking too much time to make estimates. And we would go through the, the exercise, we would create the estimates, but there was still somehow a, 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 narrow, a narrow margin lying around. In, in our figure, and uh, 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 this is a, a good example of flow, first way, to eliminate waste by standardization, and when we standardize, those elements can be reused and adapt when required. So, we have the third way and the first way. Finally, if we were using the same expertise, knowledge, and breadth that we were selling to customers internally, we would be able to provide a better service, right? And we realized, you know what, this is actually something that we should consider. So, even being an IT service provider, Solnet realized that, that the same cost of action that DevOps offers are available for them. The three ways, all the way. We reduce work in progress, we reduce waste, we create feedback loops, we increase quality, and we enable organizational learning. Organizational learning and experimenting. So, led by those findings, led by the state of the market back in New Zealand, Solnet decided something that we call back there, eat its own dog food and embark on a DevOps experiment. An experiment. But what is the best way to experiment? We have already learned that service providers are no different than any other organization. Therefore, we use tools to reinforce our culture and accelerate desired behavior changes. And that's what the Solnet decided to do. Our hypothesis was we would create a tool, we would give the tool for internal teams, and with them using the tool to deliver and support solutions for our customers, we would measure their performance and we would analyze the adoption of practices that we had embedded in the tool. The plan for this tool was to first reduce significantly project setup time, or the sprint zero, by automating infrastructure, automating service configuration, and automating pipelining at the start of a project. Also, we would fully entrench the adoption of expected practices by embedding a pipeline on the source code of the application, editing the source code and applying minor changes when required, and finally reacting 
to special events like merge requests or pipelines triggered or finally testing results. This automation Met Orchestrator was a fast development platform centralizing and orchestrating existing automation tools, tracking tools, source code management tools, cloud hosting services, and other different building blocks required in a project to standardize application stacks for developers, for CZ means, testers, architects, managers, and others. The tool was called Solve. The idea was conceived in November 2016, and in March 2018, the MVP was ready. At that moment, only our early adopters had sold the tool, so we collected everyone from the company in a town hall, and we played a video. This video you see here right now with a project being created from scratch. The developer or the engineer would fill the form with the project name, users to access, repositories to be created, select where to host and how many environments, and submit. Solve would interact with the APIs, create the elements, and connect webhooks to ensure end-to-end -end automation. This way, developers would only need to develop the application. SREs would only need to develop the infrastructure. The infrastructure saved on the same source code as the application. Testers would need only to develop the tests, also the same source code. And as change were committed to the source code, the created pipelines, also committed on the same source code, would kick in and take action building, testing, deploying, and releasing. All those elements follow better tested designs and patterns that once inside the source code should help cement the knowledge across the team. So what you see here in the video is the creation of a Bitbucket repo with an example application on it and elements added and committed on top of the example application. Uh, a Slack channel for communication, and you can see uh, a, a bot that would uh, propagate uh, uh, events in, in, in the channel. Uh, you could see also uh, one OpenShift project for each environment requested through the tool. Uh, you will see also uh, a Jenkins pipeline for managing build, test, deploy, and release, embedded in OpenShift, and finally an online IDE for fast development. So uh, uh, the, the town hall presentation was very well received and uh, uh, the company got a huge interest in what we had developed and we had to do a hands-on demo probably a week after that. And after that, we assigned our first project to solve. So uh, uh, what you see here uh, on the video, the video is ending, is the online IDE where the code is already checked and you can see the elements created on it. The Docker files, the Jenkins pipelines, they are all in there. So this went on for a few months, developers using the tool and we gathering their feedback, new, new application stacks being added and the process enforced by automation. This happened for a while. Then we began to harvest the results from the experiment and here they are. From a process perspective, there was an exponential increase in speed. We were delivering ready-to-use environments in 10 minutes, and this was down from weeks. That was awesome. Uh, also, the tool helped for us to advertise application patterns and application processes internally to other teams. Uh, and those patterns were matching the vision that the company desired. Therefore, in our projects where the tool was considered, we had a massive desire from the employees to try and contribute back to the tool. And this was also very, very well received uh, because they actually expected their desired choice embedded in the tool. They wanted to see that in the tool and we had to add a feature in the tool so employees could upload their application stack. From a cultural perspective, it was easy to notice the increase in engagement. The employees were now talking about the tool, where it could and couldn't work. It, it, it was a very, a very, very good thing to see. Uh, we also had a great buy-in from, from managers, and once the, the engagement increased, they became more aligned with it, up to the point where the managers were fighting to get employees assigned to solve development. 
uh, finally, uh, uh, we could realize how everyone embraced the practices automated on the tool. Suddenly, what we expected the engineers to do, the knowledge we expected them to absorb, the way of doing things, this was everywhere. It became everyone's day-to-day -day practices. And everyone was happy. We managed to get the shift as we desired. Cheers, right? However, still with all this positivism, all those findings came with important lessons learned that I bring to you so you can attempt an experimentation yourselves, okay? First and foremost, change and adoption, even of new tools by technologists, is especially hard and not everyone embraces it. And this is something that many have said here in the conference and I will repeat them all. Success takes time. Only hard work will bring you closer to success. But luckily for us, we had our early adopters and once we matured the interface, more people were keen to get on board. Also, the premise of the tool helped us. So uh, 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 this made it easy for the company to reach critical mass for adoption across the company. So if you are out there leading an experimentation, you need early adopters. They will even help you in identifying all the sympathetic employees across the company. Also, it is important to give time for the company to discuss. And yesterday on Open Spaces, we were talking about pipelines and someone asked me about uh, uh, adoption of culture. Is, is the person that asked me that here? But if you're here, this one is for you, okay? If you're leading the experimentation, it's important you make the right questions or you lead the company to ask the right questions. As they talk through the several subjective answers to those questions, they will themselves come to an agreement. And more importantly, this agreement will take in consideration the company and its culture. So a positive agreement means a compromise from everyone to move in a new direction. Engineers have a lot of time and experience with their specific tools, so to make them swap, it's not easy. You really have to make it very intuitive. The tool has to be intuitive for them to adopt. And from our perspective, it was important that uh, 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 they solve the practices behind the tool. However, if the tool doesn't have a, a, a good use experience, no one will get to use the tool, therefore no one will be embraced by the practices we had embedded in the tool. So if you're leading an experimentation, ensure that you are spending the right amount of time across experience of your end users. This Met Orchestration platform had application stacks that can run on many platforms and relies on many technologies. This turned out to be a fantastic design principle because it gave all developers the ability to contribute with their own stacks to the tool or to eat the existing tools to their desire. If we had created a niche tool that would do only a specific corner of the business, we surely would not have the same acceptance of the company. So if you're leading experimentation, you must ensure that you are covering sorry, the biggest number of use cases. Of course, you can't have it all. So it's also your role to ensure you are saying enough no's as you are saying yes. But you will know when you have the optimal number, when you have enough early adopters for every use case of the tool. Lastly, and this goes without saying, right? You must have feedback. And there is no such thing as too much feedback. If you're leading experimentation, make sure you listen to feedback and put good feedback loops in place. For our case, we got direct feedback from developers, from project managers, from early adopters, from UAT testers, and also from sprint perspectives. And we have built a feedback box. On every screen, the employees had the opportunity to report bugs and provide feedback by pressing the very beautiful feedback button on the top right, left, sorry. And paraphrasing the DevOps book one more time, this was 
for Sonnet, our aha moment, or the plot twist, if you may. Took us some time, as the slot here, but we got there. The thing is, all the practices we have embedded in the tool, they were there, but we never made it clear that we had intentionally put those practices there. They were there, and we said, the company wished you to work that way. So we were reading the, the feedback given to solve, and uh, after some time, we realized that the employees started to give us practices, suggestions, that were aligning with the practices of the tool, but they were affirming that those suggestions were, and I quote here, the common practices. And people be, were surprised by reading that, that feedback, by hearing that feedback. So if I were in Brazil, and Marcelo will understand what I'm going to say here, the correct statement to des describe the surprise in the meeting room would be that for a moment, the lamp pole was taking a leak on the dog. Or that somehow the mouse was chasing the cat. I mean, things were in opposite of what they were supposed to be. But I, I was amazed. I was amazed because our feedback loop worked. It really worked. There was no better way to see that what we desired was perceived by everyone. And the handbook makes it very clear. Everywhere you perform work, you must create a feedback loop somehow. Without it, it would take us much, much longer to understand when the practices had become common to our audience. So one more time, your experimentation must have a feedback loop. So, this tool helped us create better solutions uh, for customers and embed the practices that the company saw as best from day one and those same best practices and principles have in turn helped Solnet become a better company and create the right culture of participation, collaboration, and excellence for its employees. So to conclude this talk, this is the message I would like to leave here today. I feel that given the opportunity, similar experiments under the DevOps umbrella are bound to give the same results. Since they foster changes by self-reflection, common sense, and collaboration. They promote changes from the bottom to top, between peers, then later to their managers, and they help automation, which gives back time to engineers, who can use that time to focus on business value rather than technology problems. Also, DevOps can be this actor playing the role of cultural changer in your company, no matter what industry you're in or what service you provide. As the handbook says, DevOps offers a solution. So if we create dynamic learning organizations to increase the collaboration among their peers, we, we, share, we create equally shared responsibility and autonomy. And with feedback loops in place, you'll be able to reach fast flow with reliability, high employee satisfaction, and the ability to win the marketplace. So to quote the DevOps handbook one last time, this scientific approach and interactive method guides all of our internal improvement processes, but also how we perform experiments to ensure that the products that we build, and I add here, the cultural changes that we desire, actually help your internal and external customers to achieve their goals. I have collected here some reading material for you after this presentation. Uh, some researches made about experimentation from Facebook, Google, and Microsoft. I have here a list of good movie scenes that you can use to learn a bit about leadership. And obviously, the DevOps handbook, if you don't have it yet. But I'm sure everyone here has a copy of the DevOps handbook, right? Yeah? Cool? Amazing. Also, I'll be publishing the slides on my GitHub account shortly. I thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Blayson. We will take only one question. So still get a chance to do DevOps without higher management support? Definitely. Definitely. This idea began as a one-man idea. And after I presented it to my managers, the managers understood the vision behind it. And 
it was the matter of you know going through designing it and developing it right so uh, a little bit of background about the tool the tool is developed in golang it uses kafka as an event source for for events so we don't have a database uh, it talks to, to many uh, 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 many different apis it's hosted on docker and i literally had to on the on the start of the, of the mvp i had to do that all by myself during nights out of business hours or sometimes when I had free time during business hours but literally it was my desire to see the vision fulfilled that made me begun to develop the MVP it was my manager's desire to see the change in the company that made them embrace the experimentation I was proposing to them but it began with me so if you are out there another lesson for you you need to be the first step you need to get your computer and begin planning and developing and deploying and trying yourself until you reach somewhere you feel it's better for who is next to you. That's what I would tell you. Thank you, Clayton. One more round of applause.